Welcome to Dover Gorge, and thank you all for coming to our Science in the Bible mini conference. Um, we're super excited that y'all are here. Our goal at Dover Gorge is to inspire and equip people to be passionate followers of Christ. And that's why we kind of scheduled this event. We had a few people that had some questions, so we're like, let's set up a little conference so that we can answer those questions, hopefully. So we're going to be looking at Genesis and why it's important to the Christian faith, and then Dr. Falling over here is going to be talking about some of the evidence for the Bible. Um, my name is Michael. I think I know most of y'all. And then I have a beautiful wife and son, Sarah and Spires. And they are awesome. We work here at Dover Gorge, and then we run Genesis Animal Sanctuary. So I primarily teach with animals and teach about creation. And... It's pretty fun. So I came from a Christian home. Oh, we need to mute that. I came from a Christian home. When I grew up, what was that? When I grew up, I was pretty good at doing random stuff with my body. And right out of high school, I joined the circus. I moved to New York to become a performer. And then right after that, I moved to Las Vegas and worked in one of the largest shows in the world. Um, it was about a $120 million theater, and it was an awesome experience. But during that time, I was not grounded in my faith when I left, and I fell away pretty hard. I was not following Christ throughout this entire thing. And I trained my entire life to do this stuff, and I made it to the top. Like, I was in one of the best shows in the world, and I was one of the top athletes in that show. And it was such a cool experience. And then I was filming with my team a PR event for The Ellen Show. I was doing a handstand on top of two guys and my finger clicked. And I came down, I couldn't move my finger, ran over. They like kind of relocated it. Right after that, figured out that I had avascular necrosis in my hand, which is where the bone dies and it basically disintegrated and that ended my career. So after, 18 years of training, it like in a blink of an eye, it was gone. And it was very stressful. Um, and that was God just being like, you are not doing what I want you to. It was the most incredible thing that's ever happened. I am so thankful that God took it away from me because that's what I needed. It's not what I wanted though. And so that happened lost my career, and then I went back to the drawing board. I was pretty mad at God during that time. And the other thing that I've always loved was animals. I moved back here, I got connected with that lady right there, and this guy right here, two very influential people in my life, and started looking into how I can work with animals, and then I fell in love with the creation, and fell more in love with the creator. And it was awesome because I got to work with animals and share Christ with people with an avenue that's very effective because people really like animals and it opens up a lot of doors for us. So that's a short background for me and we want to equip people to know why and what they believe. So knowing what and why you believe it is super important. Growing up in church, I was told like, believe Jesus because he's good. And that was pretty much it. I was never taught to defend my faith. And as a result, when I left and people questioned it, I was like, eh, you're right. I don't, that's not really what I believe because I didn't know why. And it's super important to teach your kids and to equip yourselves to know why you believe what you believe. In 1 Peter 3.15 it says, But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that is in you, or the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. We need to be able to give an answer when someone asks. And a lot of people, probably one of the most books under attack is Genesis. People are going after Genesis, because if you can disprove Genesis, it kind of makes the rest of the book crumble. And that's what we're gonna go over today, the relevance of Genesis. Why is Genesis important? Does the age of the earth matter? The authority of scripture, and then Dr. Falling is gonna go over some of the incredible scientific evidence 
that confirms the Bible. So I'm going to define a few terms before we get started so we're all on the same page. When I mention God, I'm talking about the God of the Bible, the all-powerful, all-knowing, supernatural God who created the heavens and the earth. That is the God I am talking about. When I talk about evolution, I'm not talking about that things change over time. Everyone knows things change over time. I'm talking about Darwinian evolution, molecules to man, goo to zoo by way of the zoo. That everything came from nothing, basically, <laughs> by mindless processes. And then science, the intellectual and practical activities encompassing the systematic study of structure and behavior of the physical and natural world through observation and experience. And then we'll be talking about the fossil record, and that is all the fossils that have been preserved in sedimentary rock. And in the back, we have a little fossil display if you guys want to look at some fossils. So why is a literal Genesis so important? It identifies who God is, it identifies who man is, and it is the basis for the gospel. The very first thing God tells us about himself is, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The God of the Bible is the God who created everything. He is the supernatural God that's all-powerful and all-knowing. It identifies who man is. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over all the livestock and the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Mankind is created separate from the animals. The animals were created after their kind. Man was created in the image of God. And, to blow y'all's minds, male and female, he created them. There are only two genders. <laughs> Pretty cool. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the Bible said it, and then science confirmed it. So, X, X, and X, Y. That's all you get. You're living in the wrong. <laughs> yeah, apparently. And then, it's the basis for the gospel. God saw all that he made, and it was very good. In the original creation, there was no death suffering. The creation was perfect. And the... Lord God commanded the man, you can do all of this stuff, but you cannot eat from this one tree. For when you do it, you will certainly die. If you disobey me, you will certainly die. Guess what? <laughs> Adam and Eve ate the fruit, and as a result of that, that's when death and sin and everything enter the world. How many people have heard, if God is good, then why? Why is there so much death and suffering? Why did my mom die? Why do I have cancer? That's a huge question in today's society, and a lot of churches have not explained it well. The reason why God is still good in this is because when you go back to the original sin or the origin of sin, it doesn't go back to God. It goes back to man. Man is the reason that this whole world is cursed. Not God. God said, if you do this, you die. And Adam deliberately disobeyed God. And as a result, we have this fallen world that is miserable a lot of the time. And that's super important to know. Man is the person who messed up God's beautiful creation, his perfect creation. Romans 5.19 says, For just as through the disobedience of one man many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man many will be made righteous. It's talking about Adam in that first part. In Adam, all are sinners, but Jesus Christ came and lived a perfect life for us. That's incredible. And many can be made righteous through Jesus Christ. Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's going back to Genesis when God said, if you sin, if you disobey me, you die. The wages of sin is death. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
And if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your hearts that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. The gospel starts in Genesis. It's super crucial to the Christian faith because he outlines everything that's about to come. It's awesome when you can look back and you start in Genesis. A lot of people, if you read a book, most people start at the beginning, except for the Bible. They start wherever they want to. But when you start at the beginning, it makes the whole book make so much more sense. It's awesome. I never started at the beginning growing up. And then when I started studying creation and I went back to it, it changed my life. And when you look and you can see God's creation and that God created it and you can make that realization that like, let me look at this and see that God made this. It's incredible and it lets you worship him so much more. Absolutely incredible. So the age of the earth, does it matter? Should it matter to Christians how old the earth is? Is that an important topic? It's super controversial. A lot of churches are old earth. And, but does it matter? That's what we're going to look out today. I'm going to say yes, it does matter. And the reason why is because the age of the earth directly affects the gospel message. And anything that affects the gospel is an important topic. So man, man says versus what God says. Time, what man says, is time is in fact the hero of the plot. What we regard as impossible on the basis of human experience is meaningless here. Given so much time, the impossible becomes possible, the possible probable, and the probable virtually certain. One only has to wait, and time itself performs the miracles. That is the view of evolution. If we just give it a ton of time, like stuff will happen. That's not how it works. The scientific evidence is 100% against that. And what God says is in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so when we get to look at evidence, you guys can choose for yourself, but I've studied a lot, and the evidence is in favor of God created. You see design everywhere, and design requires a designer. So where do we get an old earth from? Uh, the rock layers, basically. Uh, it's commonly taught that the earth is about 4.5 billion years old. And that comes from these rock layers. So the lower layers have been laid down a long time ago, and all these layers have built up over millions of years. And it also, because evolution has to take a long time because you can't see it happening, that's another thing that they get millions of years from. So does the Bible tell us the age of the earth? It doesn't come out and outright just tell us the age of the earth, but it does give us the genealogies. So you can go through... And you can add up and get a rough estimate of how old the earth is. So from Adam to Abraham is about 2,000 years. From Abraham to Jesus is about 2,000 years. And Jesus to present is about 2,000 years. So you're getting a rough estimate, six, 7,000 years in there. A very young earth compared to 4.5 billion years old. It's a big difference. One question I have got a lot, is couldn't God have used millions of years to create everything? God is God. He can do what he wants to. But the question you have to ask is, what does God's word clearly tell us? What does God's word say about this? We're going to look at that. So did God create the world? This is a theme that goes from Genesis to Revelation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Psalm 33, by the word of the Lord... The heavens were made, their starry hosts, by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let the people of the world revere him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. Colossians 1, 16 and 17. For in him all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And in Revelation 4.11, it says, 
You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. The God of the Bible is the God who created everything. Did God create the world in six days? In Exodus 20.11, when he's writing the Ten Commandments, for in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Seems like six days. When people try to put millions of years into the Bible, the only place that you can possibly squeeze it in there is in Genesis before man was created. And we're going to talk about that. So, did he create in six literal 24-hour days? If you read the text, it seems pretty clear. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. There was evening, and there was morning. There was evening, there was morning. There was evening, there was morning. There was evening, and there was morning. These are six literal 24-hour days that God created the earth. He also defines a day. He created the sun, the moon, the stars to define days and years and seasons. And then let's look at what was Jesus' view of creation. In Mark 10, 6, he says, But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. If there was long ages before he created man on day six, then he wouldn't be creating them at the beginning of creation. He also affirms the writings of Moses. But do not think I will, be, I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom your hopes are set. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But since you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? So he also affirmed what Moses wrote about him in Genesis. And Jesus and God are one and the same. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. And John 1.14, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Jesus and God are one and the same. Jesus was there in the beginning of the world. So he would know. <laughs> so he says, at the beginning, he made them male and female. And then also, I'm going to pull this one back up. For in six days, not only did God say this, he wrote it for us on a stone tablet. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. The text is pretty clear that these are six literal 24-hour days. There's no place to put long ages in here. Paul warned us about this stuff. He says, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophies which depend on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. The theory of evolution is a hollow and deceptive philosophy. They tell a really nice story and a lot of people have bought into it. But it doesn't check out. If you actually dig in, there's no roots to what they're saying. And the ones that are, are pretty, pretty shallow. And he also says in 2 Corinthians, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have the divine power to dis demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge, knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. A lot of churches are not doing this. They compromise what the Bible says to be friends with the world. They're like, ah, oh, science says 4.5 billion, so let's just kind of stick it into the Bible. That's what a lot of people are doing these days, and it affects the gospel message. It makes you inconsistent in what you believe. So why does the age of the earth matter? It matters because it is a conflict with the gospel message. It directly affects it. 
If millions of years is true, it destroys the Bible's teaching on death, it assaults the character of God, it contradicts what Jesus believed and taught about the age of the earth, and it undermines faith in the gospel. So we're going to look at where this came from. Millions of years comes from the geological record. So the rocks up top are younger than the rocks on the bottom. So you can see all these layers. This is back in the gorge. It's a really cool formation. But so your rocks down here are older than the rocks up there is what is commonly taught. And so they'll date these rocks at like millions of years. And the issue is that is you find fossils in all of those layers, which are the remains of dead organisms. And you cannot have death before the fall. When you put millions of years into the Bible, that's what happens, is you end up with death before Adam sinned. If there's death before Adam sinned, then the wages of sin is not death. And Christ's sacrifice on the cross would not pay your penalty. Therefore, it meant nothing that he died. You can't pay for something with a currency that's invalid. Here are a few of the fear, gap theory, day-age theory, theistic evolution, framework hypothesis, local flood theory, progressive creation. These are all compromises that Christians have made. The, day, the gap theory puts millions of years between the first two verses of the Bible. Day-age theory, each day is like a long age of time. Theistic evolution, God used evolution to create the world, and so on. If there is death before Adam sinned, the wages of sin is not death. So you cannot add those millions of years into those first six days of creation. It doesn't work. You cannot have death before Adam sinned. And when you do that, you destroy the basis for the gospel. And that's why the age of the earth does matter, because it does affect our consistency. And just so I'm being super clear, no one is saved by believing in a young earth. And no one will go to hell for believing in an old earth. You are saved solely on whether you put your faith in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord or not. But by accepting billions or even millions of years, you are being inconsistent in what you believe. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. The controversy about the age of the earth is a controversy about the authority of Scripture. Is the Bible God-breathed, or is it not? Because if it's not, and millions of years is true, then the Bible can't speak with authority on anything. And the effect of these compromises that people make is if one accepts billions or even millions of years for the age of the earth, then one has accepted death before Adam sinned, this is because in the evolutionary scheme of things, the fossil record is thought to be millions of years in age and that most of it existed before man evolved. Thus, to accept the evolutionist view of the fossil record is to accept death over millions of years that led up to man. This is totally contrary to scripture. In fact, to accept death before sin is to destroy the basis for the gospel message. If millions of years is true, then God is cruel and doesn't care about his creation. And he either can't communicate clearly or he is a liar. God's word is true. It is the word of God. It is trustworthy. And our faith is not a blind faith. There is so much evidence that confirms the Bible. And when you actually open your eyes, a lot of people have a hard time seeing it. What's up, dude? Um, a lot of people have a hard time seeing it. But when you can be shown that this evidence confirms the Bible and how incredible it is, it is absolutely awesome. And then we're going to take a five-minute break so we can swap computers and stuff. And then Dr. Falling is going to come up and talk about some of the amazing evidence for science and the Bible. So my name is Steve Falling. And uh, yes, I hate talking about myself, but uh, I know when I hear, hear a speaker speak, I like to know, you know where they're coming from. Otherwise, you're thinking the whole time, you know, who is this guy and why, why should I even listen to him? But I'm a, a PhD in uh, organic chemistry from the University of California, Berkeley. I've been in uh, this area for quite a few years. Came to Eastman uh, Chemical Company 
uh, Eastman Kodak at the time in Kingsport, Tennessee, and worked there for 31 years in research, development, pilot plant, production, uh, everything. But I, I love chemistry, I love all the sciences, and uh, I just thank God that he brought me to Tennessee to, uh, to, to hear the gospel and uh, you know, to eventually lead, lead me to uh, trusting Jesus alone as my savior. I know when I became a Christian, I thought, well, people are gonna wonder you know, how I can believe the Bible when science contradicts it. So uh, immediately, uh, 40 years ago, I uh, began studying the subject of uh, creation science, uh, science and the Bible, studying the Bible, uh, took Greek at Milligan College, and, and anyway, um, uh, I just uh, thank God that he, he brought me to Tennessee. So I love it here, I love Doe River Gorge especially. Um, so that's uh, just a little bit about, about myself. I'm an organic chemist. I am not a paleontologist. I am not a geologist. I'm strictly a, an amateur a hobbyist in, in, this, in these subjects. But uh, I'd like to talk today about uh, does the fossil record support the theory of evolution? Now, I usually give a talk on fossils over about two one-hour sessions. And Michael only gave me 45 minutes. So I've had to uh, pare this down uh, to, to my chagrin. Um, so this, uh, hopefully, hopefully it still comes together smoothly, but uh, uh, realize that there's, a, there's so much that can be said about this subject. And I will uh, uh, have to go and s scratch the surface, really, only. So uh, this is the Grand Canyon. Uh, you might say it's the uh, uh, Exhibit A for the evolutionists, for deep time, long ages. Uh, carving the canyon supposedly over billions of years is what they, the, the uh, typical evolutionists would say. And I love the Grand Canyon. I, I've been there many times, hiked down it. I took a, a, um, a one week uh, raft trip down the Grand Canyon about a year ago and uh, with, with some excellent creationist teaching. And uh, in preparing for the talk, I, I thought, uh, uh, what, what does Wikipedia say about the formation of the Grand Canyon? And uh, of course you have to be careful about Wikipedia, but this is what you know, the evolutionists would say. It says that nearly uh, two billion years of Earth's geological history uh, have been exposed as the Colorado River and its tributaries cut their channels through layer uh, uh, after layer of rock while the Colorado, Colorado Plateau was uplifted. <clears throat> okay, so, so that's the, the Grand Canyon from the evolutionist point of view. Um, but that, that's contradictory to what the Bible says. The Bible really uh, indicates a young earth, and I'm a young earth creationist. So what's, what's going on here? There's two uh, very different views of, of this uh, canyon. Well, it comes, comes down to worldviews, and I'm sure you've, you've heard the term worldview. Uh, the, the, the secular uh, evolutionists will look at the canyon and say, wow, look what a little bit of water did over many, many uh, millions or billions of years. And then the, the uh, Bible-believing uh, creationist looks at the canyon and says, wow, look what a lot of water did over a short amount of time. Um, these are two very di different points of view, looking at the same, very same evidence. Uh, so what's going on here? And it's because of our worldview. And you could imagine a worldview as being like a lens that you uh, see evidence through, and it, and it uh, affects what, how you interpret that evidence. Uh, one of the uh, definitions of worldview is it's a network of presuppositions untested by natural science, and in light of which all experience and evidence is uh, interpreted. So that's, that's the difference here. We have two different worldviews, one based on holy uh, scripture, God's word, um, the creator, uh, the other based on, world and on uh, human theories, Darwinism, deep time, uh, evolution, and so forth. Now, in the Grand Canyon, just very briefly, there, there's evidence like this. Uh, this is a fold in the sedimentary rock layers found in the Grand Canyon. And you can see it makes like a Z shape there. Now, how could that have happened? You know, just like a, uh, a hard taco shell, you can't open it up without it crumbling. 
but a, a soft tortilla or soft tor uh, taco, you can fold it and it won't crack. Well, rocks, you can't bend rocks without them crumbling. Yet this is smoothly cut into a, um, uh, a double bend. And so that's, uh, that's evidence that needs to be interpreted. I mean, how, how do you explain that from the evolutionary view where this is hard rock that got exposed by erosion or the, the creationist that looks at it and says, well, this was so had to have been soft layers, soft sediment that got uplifted, uh, bent into a, a fold like that, and then it solidified. Those are the two different ways of interpreting this uh, evidence. And since uh, Michael talked about it, uh, we don't need to go into detail about uh, what we see here at Doe River, which is an excellent example. Isn't this called Party Point right here? And you can see the, the, the wonderful curves in the, in the rock there. These, these sedimentary rock layers had to have been soft and pliable, flexible, and then uplift occurred, causing the bending, and then it set up. You can't explain this from a traditional uh, slow erosion of hard sedimentary rock. Now this, this uh, uh, spot right here is five or 10 minute walk from here. You can see it today if you want. It's right through the first tunnel. And that's me uh, in front of that curve. It makes a beautiful curve there. And as far as I know, this is not, does not have a name. So I propose Falling Rock for, <laughs> for this. For, <laughs> This is Falling Rock, you know, we'll we've named it. Day. Okay. Well, I think they make street signs that say Falling Rock. I know, I'm famous I'm all over the country. <laughs> My favorite is when it said Falling Rocks. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, what, 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 can we, what can we bring together here? Uh, again, I'm a, I am believe the Bible, God's holy word, he, was the, he's, he is the creator. And from the, uh, the Bible in Genesis, we read about Noah, we re read about the ark, we uh, re read about the flood. Now, I know you're all very familiar with this, this, these uh, subjects, and I can't go into a lot of detail to uh, talk about these things, but they're very controversial in, in this day and age, aren't they? And so uh, what I want to focus on today is that the fossils that we find in the world is really good evidence for the flood of Genesis. And, uh, and I say that what we read in God's word agrees with what we see in God's world. Now, uh, uh, unfortunately, I have to cut the, the number of scriptures short to get everything else in. So I'm going to read a few key verses to um, make a point about, uh, that leads into the rest of the talk. So uh, again, talking about the flood, talking about Noah, the, the rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. On the very same day, Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. They and every beast after their kind and all the cattle after their kind and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind and every bird after its kind, all sorts of birds. So they went into the ark to Noah by twos of all flesh in which was the breath of life. Those that entered, male and female of all flesh, entered as God had commanded him, and the Lord closed it behind him. Then the flood came and the earth was upon the earth for 40 days, and the water increased and lifted up the ark so that it rose above the earth. The water prevailed and increased greatly upon the earth, and, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. The water prevailed more and more upon the earth so that all the high mountains everywhere under the heavens were covered. The water prevailed 15 cubits higher and the mountains were covered. <clears throat> all flesh that moved on the earth perished, birds and cattle and beasts and every swarming thing that swarms upon the earth and all mankind. And all of, it, all of that was on, and all that was on dry land, all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life died. Now, an important point here is that this was God's righteous judgment on wicked mankind. Um, God was the creator, created them, created us, uh, and, and he chose to save uh, righteous Noah and his family. But the, the um, uh, punishment of the wicked was, was his prerogative, it was his right, because you know, they were wicked. 
And so uh, an, an amazing uh, story of uh, event, true history, uh, that we read about in the Bible. Now, just uh, about four or five hours north of us is the Ark Encounter uh, erected by Answers in Genesis. If you haven't been there, I highly recommend you visit. It's a wonderful exhibit. It's a world-class museum, and it gives a really good description of how the, built, the Ark was built, how the animals could have been housed and cared for. It's a very good demonstration of the feasibility of, of uh, doing what the Bible says was done. <clears throat> Now, uh, a few definitions. Uh, fossil. I'm sure most of you, or probably all of you know about fossils. Probably some of you know more than I do. But a fossil is the, the remains or, or trace of a once living thing preserved by natural processes. And when I refer to the fossil record, I'm referring to all fossils collected as well as undiscovered. Uh, Certainly, most of the undiscovered ones will never will be. They're so deeply buried. <clears throat> now, I'd like to show you a few examples of fossils. I, I love fossils. I've collected them since a kid. And so bear with me, because I, I love showing pictures of fossils. <laughs> but these are, are shark's teeth, pretty commonly found in, in uh, Florida and other, other places around the world. Uh, this is a Tyrannosaurus rex tooth, they say. It's even serrated like a, like a steak knife. <clears throat> now this is a trilobite. This is a, actually one in my collection, one of my, my earliest uh, uh, specimens that I got as a kid. It's only about an inch and a half long, and I think it's over there. You can look at it. But, but trilobites can be quite large. Here's a picture of my hand. Looks like even my same shirt. <laughs> um, and you can see that the trilobites can actually be quite large, you know, as big or bigger than a, than a dinner plate. But trilobites are extinct marine arthropods, kind of like insects of the, of the ocean. And as far as we know, they're, they're extinct. But they must have existed by the trillions in the ocean. And evidently, the, the uh, events of the flood, the change in the salinity, pH, uh, sediment, or whatever, uh, the trilobites were susceptible to, to that kind of condition, and they died off. And so those fossils are found all over the world in great numbers. <clears throat> Now this is a crinoid or crinoid, not sure the pronunciation, a sea lily. It looks like a, uh, a plant, but it's actually an animal. And uh, these are still extant today. Uh, the, the stem part here uh, is like little discs, and the, the uh, fossils of these are quite common. I, I remember finding these in Middle Tennessee as a kid, and they look like little beads with a hole in the middle. And so they're quite, quite common. This is a piece of petrified wood. It, the, it's one of mine. I think I got this at Canyon de Chez in Arizona. Uh, it's the, the specimen is over there on the, on the back uh, table. I think it looks more like petrified roast beef, but I could be, could be wrong. Beef jerky. <laughs> now, I'm from California <clears throat> for coming here. <clears throat> and uh, of course, the, the redwoods are common in California. And these are petrified or, or fossilized redwood trees. They're like six feet in diameter. They're huge. Now, when I'm talking about old fossils, I need to be careful in using the, this, uh, this slide here. As you can see, uh, the old fossils on the left, and that's my, my wife on the right. But anyhow, that, she's there for scale. And so that's a, a triceratops um, uh, skull. Now this, this is an interesting fossil because uh, it, it shows two different animals. It shows a land-dwelling dinosaur, small dinosaur, overlapping with a fish. So we have a creature that lives on land and a creature that lives in the water. I wonder how that could have come about. Now there's my hand again um, next to a footprint. This is a, a, a theropod dinosaur that took this picture in Moab, Utah. And, uh, so uh, fossils can also be trace fossils, like footprints. Now, here's a picture of a uh, dinosaur fossil uh, with, with the bones uh, still in their anatomical correct position. They call that articulated. And so this was at uh, Dinosaur National Monument and uh, uh, interesting specimen. Now, this, this fossil, I, 
I, I would say it's probably the most famous fossil in the world. Uh, I think it is. It's Archaeopteryx. It's an extinct bird. Um, and uh, I'll be talking about Archaeopteryx in, in great detail in, in, a, in a few minutes. Now, one thing to notice here is that the Archaeopteryx, the dinosaur up here, and this dinosaur, notice how their necks are bent backward, way back, uh, almost unnaturally. And that's called, that's called the dinosaur death pose. It's so common that, that uh, paleontologists for years have wondered why, why do we find these, these uh, dinosaurs and other animals, even mammals, uh, with this unusual pose. And it's, it's been shown from modern scientific studies that it's due to asphyxiation, either drowning or you know, poisonous gases or something. So uh, it's just one more little bit of evidence that these creatures uh, probably died from drowning. Steve? Yes. Just the neck, just move the neck. I, I, it's, it's so common to be bent back, the head back, back like that. It's, they've even given it that, that pose. Yeah. They did studies when they drowned chickens and chickens beat up. No, they yeah. did. Yeah, they put chickens, <laughs> drown chickens and see what they do. She has lots of chickens. Let's try it. There's an experiment for ex you all. <clears throat> OK, so. Uh, there's a lot of extinct creatures that are uh, no longer with us, like this uh, turtle. And, and you've probably, many of you have probably seen Jurassic Park. This kind of fossil uh, is, uh, was made famous in Jurassic Park. It's, it's fossilized or hardened uh, tree resin, uh, and so it's amber, and it, it's uh, enclosing an insect. And you remember in the movie, they drill into it, get dino DNA out of it, and clone live dinosaurs. But um, th these, are, these are interesting fossils. I, I have one back there you can look at. Um, and so I've even seen pictures of whole lizards trapped in, in uh, amber. Now, I bet uh, several of you probably have seen this. If you've been to Chicago, been to the museum there, to the Field Museum in Chicago, well, you've seen this Tyrannosaurus rex skeleton. They, they gave it the, the, uh, <clears throat> the name Sue. They named it after the discoverer, Sue Hendrickson, the paleontologist. And so it's, a, it's said to be the most complete T. rex uh, skeleton in the world. It sold for like eight and a half million year, uh, uh, eight and a half million dollars uh, when, they, when they bought it. And so uh, it's, it's very famous. Um, <clears throat> Some years later, they, they thought, well, it really doesn't look like it's a female. We think it's a male. So it kind of brings to, to mind the, 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 uh, the music, uh, mm -hmm. A Boy Named Sue. <laughs> I just said that. <laughs> I think it's funny. OK. Um, now, uh, let me, since we're talking about T-Rex, uh, I have a little model here of a, of a T-Rex. Um, would you say that this is a life-size uh, model of a no. Tyrannosaurus? No way, right? It's, no way to, it's just a little, little model. I'm saying this is life-size. This is a life-size dinosaur. It's a model, but it's life-size. Now, why do I say that? Because dinosaurs hatched out of eggs. The Tyrannosaurus rex egg that you see here is no bigger than a, than a football, about the size of an American football. So the, the animal that hatched out of that egg had to be small. Maybe, maybe just a tad bigger than this. That's the only one I can find to buy. But anyhow, uh, the, the dinosaur that hatched out of the egg had to be small. And so that is an important point because think about Noah's Ark. People say, oh, how did Noah get all those giant sauropods, and giant animals onto the ark? Well, he didn't have to. First of all, God sent them. The Bible tells us that, the, uh, that God sent the animals to the ark. Um, you know, Noah wasn't out there lassoing them and, and rounding them up. <laughs> um, but it, they also didn't have to be large. They didn't have to be adults. They could be juveniles that, that, that came right on board and then grew to maturity uh, in large size later on. So this, this could have been a life-size, probably was a life-size dinosaur. Now at the Creation Museum, I encourage you to go there too. This is uh, just north of the, the Ark. Excellent museum, another world-class museum. Uh, you would really enjoy it. They, they have this Allosaurus there. They, they've given it the name Ebenezer. 
but uh, it's said to be the best example, best specimen of the Allosaurus in the world. Very valuable specimen, uh, beautifully displayed. And uh, so it's, it's a wonderful exhibit at the Creation Museum. <clears throat> okay, so very critical is how are fossils formed? Now, I bet many of you have had, had an aquarium with tropical fish or goldfish or something before. And, and you know, if, you, if you've had an aquarium, you've had fish die, undoubtedly, like I did as a kid. And so when the fish dies, it falls to the bottom and it gets covered up with sediment. And over, if you don't clean the tank, over years it turns into a fossil, right? Is that right? <laughs> no, that, I mean, that's, that's, that's crazy. Um, at, at, the, at the beach, when there's a dead, a dead fish, it doesn't just fall to the bottom of the, of the lake and turn into a fossil. Instead, it gets scavenged by the other, other fish, bacteria, UV radiation. Uh, in my aquarium, I usually often did not find the dead fish. It was just went missing. And I knew it had been eaten by the others and it had just, just dissolved and, and been uh, decayed by bacteria. So, so typically, when a creature dies, especially in the water, uh, it floats, is scavenged, and, and nothing is left of it. It just, it just totally decays away. In order to get a fossil, you have to have rapid burial. Okay, so in this little cartoon, we see a fish happily swimming along, and suddenly it's, it's, it's inundated with sand and silt uh, and debris uh, that covers it up, smothers it, and kills it, but it buries it to, to some good depth. So by bury, being buried that deep, the scavengers can't get to it. Uh, erosion um, uh, wouldn't get to it uh, necessarily. And so it'll slowly decay there with the bacteria, leaving often a cavity, like, like, a, like a, a mold, and uh, which minerals can fill up and create a fossil. So there's various ways that the, uh, the fossilization process can occur, but uh, uh, over a period of time, which doesn't have to be long, it doesn't have to be enormous lengths of time, it can be in a matter of months, as, as uh, modern scientists have shown. Now, uh, what's the evidence of rapid burial? Here is a, a horseshoe crab. These are still extant today. And uh, perhaps you can see it. There are uh, tracks behind the, the horseshoe crab. This, this crab was crawling along the seafloor. This is sandstone, so it's crawling along the sand. And it was trying to escape all this sand that was raining down on it. In fact, it's even better than that. And this, this is at the Creation Museum. It's a beautifully displayed up on the wall. The tracks go about 12 feet in a curve behind it. They have the whole thing uh, on the wall to display. This poor little crab, uh, crab was crawling along the, the sand, trying to escape this inundation of sand. Finally, out of exhaustion, it stopped, got buried, was killed, and turned into a fossil, which we can enjoy now. But clearly, it was alive when this all happened. Here's a, here's a, I think this is the Creation Museum as well. It's a perch, eating another perch. Uh, it, it was uh, killed and buried before it could even finish its lunch. Now another good bit of evidence for rapid burial are polystrate fossils. And one of the best is the one on the left there in, near Cookville, Tennessee. I haven't seen this with my own eyes. I really want to go there with our friend who lives out there. But, uh, and see it myself, but it's very famous. It's a 30 foot tree that was buried in sedimentary rock layers and then the, the front part uh, was exposed showing the whole tree. Now you know you can't, you can't uh, plant a tree you know, uh, several feet under, underground, it'll just die, right? So this tree could not have been standing there while the sedimentary rock layers, sedimentary uh, layers were deposited over tens, hundreds, thousands, or millions of years. The tree would have uh, decayed uh, during that period of time. This had to have been buried rapidly to, to be left in that position. And there, there's so much more that could be said about that, this curvature here. Water was flowing from right to left, the uh, geologists tell us. <clears throat> and then uh, Yellowstone, Specimen Ridge, is famous for its upright standing trees and other places around the world. 
So these are fossils that span many layers. <clears throat> okay, let's talk about fossil graveyards. A fossil graveyard is a site with a high concentration of fossilized remains. Now these are, these are all over the world. In fact, we have one right here in gray, <laughs> okay? It's a fossil graveyard. I, I've, I've been there and, and volunteered there even. But uh, they're, they're all over the world. The very famous one is Dinosaur National Monument in Utah. I talked about it a little bit already. Uh, we talk about fossil fuels, and I use that term for years without really thinking about it. Fossil fuels are fossils. <laughs> Even the gas you can call a fossil, but coal, shale, oil uh, are fossils from, from um, uh, plant in some animal matter that was buried during the flood and became coalified or, or gasified or turned into oil. Now in the Grand Canyon, it's, it's, it's famous for its fossils, especially the nautiloid fossils. At the bottom is a picture of what, a drawing of what nautiloid, uh, sort of a squid-like thing, it has an ice cream cone kind of shell with a squid end to it. And these are found in, in, in the Grand Canyon. And we saw lots of these. Our, our, our paleontologists with this uh, pointed this out again and again. Sometimes you just see a round one and it was, a, it was a nautiloid fossil that was straight up and down. Well, how does that stay straight up and down for thousands or millions of years while the layers form above it? It had to have happened quickly. But there are literally uh, billions of nautiloid fossils in the Grand Canyon. Now, evidently, southern Morocco, southeastern Morocco is, is famous for fossils. I bought a lot of, of them off eBay. And, uh, and they're really beautiful. These are trilobites. These are some that I have, and you can see them back there if you want. <clears throat> the Green River Formation in the, in the uh, southwest is uh, famous for fish and, and many other kinds of fossils. And even insects can be fossilized. And I have two of my own uh, insect fossils back there for you to look at. Now, uh, that's, this is obviously a clam. And, uh, I don't know if that's a picture of this one, but here's a, here's a fossil clam shell. Okay, what's, what's interesting about this? Well, the interesting thing is it's, it's closed up, right? When you go to the beach and you hunt for shells, what do you usually find? Something like this, right? Yeah, or you, if you're lucky, you might find two that are attached, kind of butterflied out with the, the animals dead, and then eventually the two halves fall apart. You don't walk along the beach and find a whole clam on the beach like this because live clams can dig into the, to the sand or they could dig their way up if they want to. So the fact that we find millions and millions of whole clams um, like this and smaller um, is indication of rapid burial of all these clams on the ocean floor so deeply buried that they couldn't uh, dig their way back out of, out of the, uh, the sand. Again, more evidence of rapid burial. Now, Ken Ham is the, uh, uh, the founder of uh, Answers in Genesis, the uh, Creation Museum and so forth. And he often asks this question. I've heard him say it several times. He'll say, if there was a worldwide flood described in the Bible, uh, what should we find? We should find billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. What do we find? We find billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. We find what you would expect. And, and what are we talking about here? We're talking about fossils. These dead things are the remains of uh, plants and animals that were destroyed during the flood. <clears throat> so that was a quick uh, half of the talk uh, talking about the uh, fossils, the source of fossils. What I'd like to do now is to, to look at um, how fossils really don't provide evidence of evolution, uh, contrary to what the evolutionists say. Okay, so we've been talking about fossils without using the scientific term of, uh, of the science, paleontology. And paleontology is the study of the forms of life existing in prehistoric or geologic times as represented 
by the fossils of plants, animals, and other organisms. Now, this is a Pierre uh, Paul Grasset. He was said to be the, the most famous, uh, the best known um, zoologist of the last century, a French zoologist. And he, he, he wrote this in one of his uh, books. He was, of course, an evolutionist. He, he wrote that naturalists must remember that the process of evolution is revealed only through fossil forms. A knowledge of paleontology is therefore a prerequisite. Only paleontology can provide them with the evidence of evolution and reveal its course or mechanisms. Okay, so for, for that reason, we need, all of us, you and me, need to have some understanding of paleontology because it's, it's relevant to the gospel message, to trusting the Bible. Now, without going into a lot of detail, uh, we have Charles Darwin, uh, considered to be the father of uh, evolutionary theory. And in his uh, magnum opus was entitled The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, published in 1859. The only illustration, this is surprising to me, in the whole book is that one I've, I've clipped onto the bottom left there. And it shows, it's, it's sort of a family tree, a phylogenetic tree, a tree of life that he put into the book. And that's the only illustration. And what he's trying to show, in, in, and he talks about, of course, is descent uh, from a common ancestor over time. Now, just a simplified, cartoonish drawing of the tree of life uh, would be this one here. It's meant to show that uh, uh, kind of like a, like a tree from a simple, so-called simple single cell organism uh, over uh, deep time, over many millions and billions of years, evolving into the different branches of, of life, plants and and insects and fungi and, uh, and then also a branch that takes you up to um, reptiles, amphibians, mammals, and so forth. <clears throat> so this is uh, sort of a, a illustration of that. Now, one thing to notice here is that everything on this chart is a, is a real creature, plant or animal. Um, some of them are not extant, like the the Archaeopteryx and the, and the T. rex, they don't live now, but everything shown here uh, is either currently alive or is known from uh, paleontology. Now, what it doesn't show are the transition forms between mammals and reptiles. This branch, this trunk of the tree, those are the transition forms, and there should be many of them in there. And they're not illustrated in, in a drawing like this. They usually aren't. Um, an important concept in evolutionary theory is called phyletic gradualism. And it says that complex life forms evolve from simple life forms in numerous small steps over long periods of time. And what that means is that between, say, fish and amphibians, there had been many, many, many uh, in the, uh, intermediate steps, transition forms. Uh, between the, the two uh, families. <clears throat> now, just to be sure you're clear what a transition form is, if we were talking about the evolution of the automobile, we might show an ox cart through a stagecoach to a, to a car, and this stagecoach would be the transition form of those three. <clears throat> uh, if we were talking about whale evolution, uh, they, they say whales evolved from some land creature, like a wolf, I've heard pig, they've heard, heard a lot of proposed land uh, creatures. But there should have been in between some transition forms, and really more than just two, that would uh, connect the evolutionary pathway. But um, in, in all cases, the, these are just the artist's uh, imagination, artistic license to imagine what those uh, might have looked like, and fossils like those have never been found. <clears throat> okay, so just uh, briefly, uh, what, what would we predict from evolution model and a creation model, what would you predict to see in the fossil record? <clears throat> and in the evolution model, we should see the, the simple life forms appearing first in the lower rock layers. 
there should be gradual change as you go up in, in the geologic column in those rock layers to more and more complex, from simple to complex as you go. Uh, there should be vast numbers of transition forms because the evolutionary theory talks about small uh, um, changes by mutation that cause this, this change in body design. And there should be no missing links. Missing link is kind of a popular term used in, in the press. Uh, so in evolutionary theory, there should not be any missing links. If it's a, called a missing link, it's because it has not been discovered yet. Or maybe it left new fossils, something like that. Now in the creation model, uh, believing a young earth, uh, six day creation, we should find the complex life forms appearing suddenly in great variety. By appearing, I mean in the lower layers, you, there's already complex uh, life forms fossilized there. Uh, there should be gaps separating the different kinds because evolution has not been occurring, no transitions, uh, so no transition forms. And there should be many missing links. But really, we don't need to use that term because they're not missing, they just never existed. Like if I call, called the bank and I said, I, I want to complain, uh, there's some money missing from my, my account. Oh, Dr. Falling, what, what's, what, how much is missing? A billion dollars. <laughs> now, that billion dollars never existed. It's not missing, it was just never existing, okay? They would throw me out or uh, sue me for fraud. So uh, I contend that, that transition form fossils are not found. Some that are found that are questionable, I think will, will turn out to be um, um, not transition forms at all, uh, just unique species, but I, I believe that it's, it's clear that no transition form fossils are really discovered in the fossil record. <clears throat> now who knew this better than old Charles Darwin himself? Uh, he wrote, the number of intermediate varieties which have formerly existed on the earth must be truly enormous. Why then is not every geological formation, every stratum full of such intermediate links? Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain. And this perhaps is the most obvious and gravest objection which can be urged against my theory. I give him credit for, 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 for writing that. He was being honest about the evidence. He was saying, I don't see the evidence there. But he felt as paleontology matures as a science, you know, the, the evidence would come out. Well, it's been like 160 years and still that, that statement is as true as it was when he wrote it back then. <clears throat> now, I want to talk about Icarus. No, not really. <clears throat> I, I love this picture because I think it illustrates a point. If you, if you talk about the evolution of a land-dwelling creature to a, one that can fly, there had to have been many intermediate steps. Uh, as we know in the, in the, the myth of Icarus, uh, his, his father Daedalus uh, built wings uh, for them out of wax and, and feathers, and they flew from Crete, was it, to, uh, to Greece to escape imprisonment. And so uh, Icarus flew too high, the, the, the wax melted, he fell to his death. He didn't you know, listen to his father. Um, so the point here is that I think you all would agree that you don't just strap on a pair of wings and fly off into the distance, right? There had to be a lot of anatomical changes to the body. You know, the, the way the arms or the front legs move, the, the, the lungs, the, uh, the, the, the nerves, the, the, bones. the bones need to be hollow. I mean, there are so many anatomical changes that really have to occur from a ground dweller to one that can fly. You don't just strap on some wings like the myth says. So I would like to, as a case study, you know, fossils is such a broad thing. I'm going to look at just the evolution of flight. I think this is really fun. So I'm going to talk about, uh, in evolutionary theory, how many times did the, the ability to fly evolve? And I'm introducing a word, maybe you don't know it, volant. Volant means capable of powered flight. So an ostrich is a non-volant bird, okay? And so a volant bird would be, in, in, for example, an eagle. Uh, here's a non-volant insect. Can somebody name a volant insect? 
a moth. Okay, okay. Yeah, we got a winner. I, I used a, a butterfly. Um, I think I took this picture of a, I think it's a bird wing butterfly, beautiful bu butterfly. Okay, uh, what's an example of a non-volant mammal? A, a dog? There's lots of, lots of examples, aren't there? I, <clears throat> I had gerbils when I was a kid as pets, so I, I put a gerbil picture here. Now, what's an example of a uh, volant uh, mammal? Bat. 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 Anybody else? Okay, I chose the flying monkey. What? What? What's wrong? I got that off the internet. It must be true, right? Yeah. It was on the internet? No. Isn't everything on the internet true? No. I saw a, a, a movie that had hundreds of these things flying. Okay, you're right. You, you got me. You can't trust the internet. Be very careful as what you read there. You're right. The, the bat is the only flying, <clears throat> flying mammal. Now, what's an example of a flying amphibian? Okay, remember what amphibians? They're, they're frogs, toads, salamanders. Okay, is there an example? Have an example of a flying amphibian? Okay, I went to the internet again and I found flying frogs. Okay. No, you don't believe that either, huh? No. Hi, <laughs> you're hard to, you're hard to, the fool. You're right, that's, that's not to be trusted, but that is, has the common name the, of a flying frog. Now, look at, his, look at his feet. They're really big and they're webbed. And it's really a glider. Like a flying squirrel doesn't fly, does it? It, it, it jumps and it glides. Okay, what well, we're talking about evolution of flight, we're talking about powered flight, not gliding. Because there's, there's snakes that glide. If you want to be creeped out by snakes, go to YouTube and look up flying snakes. Yeah, if you don't like snakes, you don't want to see that video. <laughs> they fly out of the trees down on you. <clears throat> but this is called a flying frog because he can jump, he spreads out his feet, and he gets a little bit of, fly, little bit of uh, glide from the jump. Okay, but no, there's no true powered flight amphibians. Now, what about a, a, a powered flight, a, a, a non-volant, a non-flyer um, reptile? Somebody. All the others. <laughs> All the others. <laughs> okay. An iguana. Iguana. Yeah, we got a winner. Yes. <laughs> okay, this can't fly. Now, what's an example of a volant reptile? <clears throat> Dragon? That's an interesting answer. Okay. Very good. I was just about to say it could be extinct. And there, there were flying reptiles, the pterodactyl. Very good. Um, so, <laughs> anyway, yeah, so there, there, there are examples of flying reptiles. These are interesting class of animals. Now, so, so evolutionists say that, that, that the flight evolved in four different um, areas, in birds and in uh, mammals, insects, and reptiles. So let's look at each one of those categories. Uh, the first one is the Quetzalcoatlus. This is said to be the largest flying creature ever. Uh, of course, it came from Texas, and uh, it had a wingspan of 36 feet. And they have it mounted in the, in the uh, foyer of their museum. I had the good fortune to, uh, to visit there and, and see it myself. And I was really curious to see what they'd say about it. And so I, I took a picture of the, uh, the poster there. And there's this one paragraph I'm going to blow up here so you can see it. They say, when pterosaurs are first seen in the fossil record, their flight apparatus is, is well formed. Truly intermediate stages in evolution from the bipedal archosaur are not known at present. So they admit there's no fossil evidence for this beautiful flying creature. And you know there had to have been a lot of intermediate steps up to that, that um, pterosaur. Here's a pterodactyl. This is a, actually at the Creation Museum. When you go there, you'll see it. It's uh, called pterodactyl. 
uh, wing finger is what that means. And you can see that one of its fingers, look how long that finger is. It's expanded and that forms the leading edge of the wing, which has a membrane, a, a skin membrane. And so uh, this is a flying creature. This one isn't very big. Um, it's about this tall, I think. But anyhow, in the fossil record, you won't find any intermediate transition forms leading from a ground-dwelling reptile and this flying reptile. There's none, zero. Okay, so quickly moving on to mammals. In the order Chiroptera, the bats is the famous one there. Now, I love this picture here. It's a picture I took of the cover of Science Magazine, really Science Journal. It's probably the most prestigious uh, scientific journal in the world. And they got their picture, these paleontologists got their picture of Icaronicorus fossil uh, right here. You can see he's kind of curled up like he was hanging from the ceiling or something. And what they've done in this picture is fascinating. It's a double exposure with a modern bat. So the modern bat, these wings are from the modern bat. They stretched out the bat, took a, an x-ray of it, and superimposed the two. And their purpose for doing that was to show how very close they were in anatomical structure. I mean, they're almost identical. And it's said to be the oldest known bat. So again, where are the transition forms for the evolution of the bat? In fact, if you try to think about what those forms must look like, they, they'll say that, well, it, it evolved from some sort of uh, ground-dwelling creature like a mouse or a shrew. But look at the big change from this creature to this one, okay? These are just drawings of, of the two skeletons. The, the, the front legs had to expand. The toes had to, to, to be uh, elongated. And if you imagine the, the intermediate form that's halfway between them, because there had to be dozens or hundreds of intermediate forms, that any of those intermediate forms would be just a monster that couldn't dig, couldn't fly. Uh, these long fingers got in the way. It would just be a monster, you know, a, a mutant that would be destroyed or, or killed by some other creature. It couldn't, couldn't fend for itself. So just thinking through the, the, uh, the scenario of this evolving into a bat, uh, you, you come across a lot of irrational intermediates. And this is well known in, in uh, the uh, paleontology circles. Here's a, here's a good quote that combines two different orders here. It says, for use in understanding the evolution of vertebrate flight, the early record of pterosaurs and bats is disappointing. Their most primitive representatives are fully transformed as capable flyers. Written by an uh, evolutionary paleontologist. I'm not going to talk in detail about, fossil, about insects. Um, you could probably identify every insect on here. These are old. Uh, these are fossilized insects. Uh, there's a, a dragonfly that, there in the middle. And so what, what we see in the, in the fossil record of insects is stasis, not change over time. But I want to focus on birds, because when we think of flying creatures, maybe birds is, probably comes to the top of the list. And I love photography. I've taken a few of these pictures myself. And uh, uh, I love birds. Michael is more of an expert in birds than I am. But uh, birds are, are amazing. And probably the most famous fossil, as I said, I think is Archaeopteryx lithographica. It's a crow-sized uh, bird, ex extinct, said to have lived 130 to 150 million years ago during the late Jurassic period. And at the Creation Museum, they tried to, to make a model of one, uh, put it up in a tree. <clears throat> now, I had the, the good opportunity to to actually see this, this fossil myself. It's in the Berlin um, Natural History Museum in Germany. And uh, they, they've, they've found more than this, this the one. There's been others. There's one in, in the London Museum as well. But, but I got to see the, the most famous, the first one found. And it's this fossil here. That's uh, one of my pictures. Now, the interesting thing about Archaeopteryx is it has claws on its, on its wing. That's interesting. You see those claws clearly? And I, you can probably tell that there's, there's teeth in its beak. Here's a bird with teeth. 
So, so is this a transition form between reptiles and, and birds? That's, what, that's what's been said for years. Okay, so it did have these reptile-like features. It had teeth, and so they would say, well, modern birds don't have teeth. You've heard the expression as rare as hen's teeth. <laughs> um, modern birds don't have teeth. So it's just, just uh, more evidence that it's an intermediate form. I had, oop, it has a long bony tail, um, which is a vestige of its uh, reptile ancestry. Uh, it has a shallow breastbone, so it must have been a poor flyer. And it has claws on its wing, <clears throat> showing tr uh, tr transitional development of the wing from a leg. So that's, that's, those are the arguments for saying that Archaeopteryx is, is a transition form, um, showing evolution. But not so fast. Let's consider this. Uh, there are fish, amphibians, reptiles, mammals, uh, with and without teeth. In an older audience, I'd say some of you don't have teeth, too. <laughs> some fossil birds had teeth. And its teeth are distinctly different, are distinctly di different from uh, reptiles. Uh, it had hollow bones. They can tell from the fossil that it had hollow bones. And its tail actually is similar to a swan. It had a furcula, which is the wishbone, uh, for attachment of, of uh, flight muscles and feet designed for perching. So very bird-like. And actually, some modern birds have claws on their wings, like the ostrich, the Watson, and the Taraco. Now, now those last two uh, have claws as juveniles, and the claws fall off as they mature. But uh, modern birds with claws on their wings. And it had a bird-like skull with movable upper and lower jaws. Like reptiles, will have the, the lower jaw will, will go up and down. There's probably a term for that. With birds, both both the jaws go like that. And they can tell Archaeopteryx had the bird-like uh, beak. Uh, and, but very importantly, Archaeopteryx had modern feathers. They, they have very good fossilized feathers in that specimen. And feathers are unique to birds. Uh, Michael, if there's time, is going to talk a little bit more about feathers to you all. Um, so I'll just say that, that um, uh, reptiles have, have folds in their skins which are called scales because the evolutionists say the scales evolved, elongated and evolved into to feathers. But, the, but these uh, scales are really just folds like pleats in a, in a, in a drape. Like, and you've seen uh, snake skins, how that comes off. Whereas feathers grow out of a follicle like a hair. Hard to explain that in evolutionary terminology. So my conclusions about Archaeopteryx are it is not an example of a transition form and does not provide support for the theory of evolution. It is better understood as just a unique, extinct bird species. And my conclusion about the fossil record is that it reveals the appearance of complex plants and animals with no evidence of transition forms and therefore contradicts the major prediction of evolutionary theory. The, the fossil record is consistent with creatures reproducing after their kind, as we read in Genesis 1, and is consistent with a worldwide marine cataclysm that annihilated the, con the continents and all flesh in which is the breath of life. So just to, to, to repeat what um, Michael has said, why is this important? Genesis and evolution are contradictory. We must choose to believe one or the other. There are consequences to what we believe, and biblically-based interpretation of scientific evidence strengthens our faith and makes us better witnesses. And I, I like this quote from Louis Pasteur, a Christian. The more I study nature, the more I stand amazed at the work of the Creator. Now, um, we have many materials, books, DVDs on display over here uh, for you to get ideas. We brought some of our favorites for you to, to look at, to, to thumb through. Uh, th these are especially good when it comes to uh, the fossil record. And uh, on the internet, there are excellent resources. 
And, and you'll be getting a, an email, I think, with uh, links to these. But Answers in Genesis, ICR, and Creation Ministry.